Consider a double-acting hydraulic cylinder and a three-position valve spring-centered in a closed center position. The oil in the cap end and the rod end are incompressible. For all intents and purposes, you can swap out this oil and fill it with rock, steel, or solid concrete. Oil is incompressible and the cylinder will remain rigid, locked, and fully extended. This would be great if you wanted to lift something heavy and lock it perfectly in place. Not so much in a pneumatic system. Consider a pneumatic cylinder at full extension. The air in the cap end is compressible. If the extended rod encountered sufficient resistance, let's say you forced a heavy weight against it, there'd be a little give to it because of air's inherent spongy, compressible nature. This would be great if you wanted to lift or push something but still absorb shocks. In summary, because of air's compressible nature, pneumatics might have a little spongy give to them. Depending upon application, this might or might not be a desirable feature. The compressibility of a fluid also influences how pressurized fluids flow through a system. The flow of incompressible oil in a hydraulic system is readily predictable because of continuity, meaning if one gallon per minute enters one end of a system, one gallon per minute must come out. A fitting analogy to describe this phenomenon might be a school bus absolutely packed with incompressible children with a door at both ends. When one incompressible kid hops on the full bus through the back door, one equally incompressible kid pops out the front. Whereas the compressible nature of gases in pneumatic systems leads to non-linearities and surges in flow. An example might be stuffing balloons onto an empty bus. At first, you can rapidly stuff more and more balloons, but soon space is filled and you got to work harder and harder to stuff more balloons in until a certain point is reached and they just kind of burst out the other side all at once. Pneumatic actuators, rather than extending and retracting smoothly the moment the flow begins, tend to rapidly pop into place once a certain actuation point is achieved. I don't intend to go into great detail about these nonlinearities. However, certain fundamental similarities remain. Larger volumes take a long time to fill at low flow rates. In contrast, smaller volumes at high flow rates fill quickly. Nonlinearities aside, flow rate still determines actuator speed. We'll examine the relationship of pressure, volume, and temperature for ideal gases in later lectures. Fluid compressibility influences other system characteristics. Consider a double-acting hydraulic cylinder with a blocked rod end port. The oil in the blocked rod end is incompressible. Again, for all intents and purposes, you could swap out that oil in the rod end and fill it with rock, steel, or solid concrete. When the valve shifted the straight through position, nothing happens. Oil is incompressible and the cylinder will not extend. Not so in a pneumatic system. Consider a double-acting pneumatic cylinder with a blocked rod end port. Schematically, blanking plugs are represented as X's or sometimes T's. If we shut off the incoming air and place a blanking plug on both the rod end port and the valve, turn the system back on and shift the valve to the extension position, we'll find the cylinder continues to extend, albeit with less force and speed as the air in the blocked rod end is compressed. Additionally, given all that compressed air in the blocked rod end, consider what happens when the cap is exhausted to atmosphere by shifting back to the retract position. The compressed air trapped in the rod end is free to re-expand and the rod springs back. The point being that the compressible nature of air makes a pneumatic cylinder with a blocked rod end port behave fundamentally differently from a hydraulic cylinder using incompressible oil. Here's yet another example of the differences between liquid and gas-based fluid power systems. Consider a partially extended double-acting hydraulic cylinder filled with incompressible oil. If I hook the rod end to the cap end, can an external force push the rod back in? The answer is no. The cap end contains more volume, the rod end less. The act of retraction necessitates that a larger cap end volume be stuffed into the smaller rod end volume, an impossible task for an incompressible liquid. If retraction won't work, can an external force pull the rod out? The answer again in practice is no. The act of extension necessitates the smaller rod end volume be stuffed into the larger cap end volume. This isn't as easy as you might suspect because the missing volume in the cap end needs to be filled by something. I suppose you could pull hard enough to make the oil in the cap end transition to its vapor phase, i.e. induce a precavitation event, but that's a less than ideal special case scenario. In summary, when configured in this fashion, a double acting hydraulic cylinder filled with incompressible oil can neither be extended nor retracted. Not so with a pneumatic cylinder. Consider partially extended double acting pneumatic cylinder with a rod end and cap end joined together at atmospheric pressure. 
can an external force push the rod back in? No problem. The larger volume of the air in the cap end compresses into the smaller end with relative ease. Can an external force pull the rod out? Not an issue. The smaller volume of air in the rod end expands into the larger cap end with relative ease. If I was moving around more than atmospheric pressure, you might observe the rod bounce back in place after repositioning it. In this capacity, the double acting cylinder would act like a shock absorber on a car or a mountain bike. To further accentuate this point, consider a pneumatic cylinder where pressurized air is routed to both the cap and the rod end. When the valve is actuated, both cap and rod end are placed at the same pressure. And because the cap end has more functional area than does the smaller rod end, the cylinder extends in a regenerative fashion. In the fully extended position, an outside force acting against the rod compresses the air trapped in the cap end. When released, the rod springs back in shock absorber fashion. I must reiterate, the compressible nature of air makes a pneumatic cylinder behave fundamentally different from a hydraulic cylinder using incompressible oil. We'll examine other features of compressible gases and components unique to pneumatic systems in later lectures. Moving on. Now that we've got at least an introduction of how compressibility affects the behavior of pneumatic actuators, let's quickly compare and contrast other features of hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Both types of fluid power systems are used to perform work quicker, more powerfully, or more efficiently than an unaided human. As we've previously discussed, the fundamental difference between these two types of systems is the type of fluid used to transfer power. Hydraulic systems make use of incompressible liquid, ordinarily oil, whereas pneumatic systems use a compressible gas, ordinarily air. Besides compressibility, other characteristics clearly distinguishes the two means of power transfer. Oil is heavy, dirty, expensive, and return flow needs to be routed to a reservoir. Spilled oil presents slip and contamination hazards, and could create a fire hazard. Air, in contrast, is clean, inexpensive, and can be exhausted directly into the environment without risk of flammability, contamination, or slip hazards. This means a pneumatic system might be a more appropriate choice for food or medical applications where cleanliness is a concern. Hydraulics have a tendency to be used for medium and heavy-duty applications, whereas pneumatic systems are customarily employed in light to medium-duty applications, where the division between light, medium, and heavy is somewhat arbitrary. Given this division, in comparison to hydraulic equivalents, pneumatic components tend to be smaller, lighter, and cheaper. Lastly, let's quickly review some safety concerns unique to fluid power systems. As you're no doubt aware, the fluid filling a fluid power system is under pressure. Hoses and containers can catastrophically rupture if pressure exceeds permitted maximums or if the hose or container is damaged. Even if something doesn't explode, compressed air itself can blind or deafen an individual if struck in the eyes or ears. Additionally, compressed air injection into the skin can cause an embolism. Escaping air can blow a veritable shitstorm of sharp, dirty debris in your eyes and lungs. Additionally, properly secured pneumatic hoses can whip around like an angry snake with a special affinity for striking unshielded eyes or genitalia. Always properly secure and test a push-to-fit pneumatic hose and give it a little tug. Never connect or disconnect hoses under pressure. Always wear safety glasses when working with pneumatic systems. At all times, consider the clearance of fluid power actuators and mechanical linkages. At no time should any portion of your anatomy you wish to keep enter the region of travel. Once a cylinder extends, it often does so with tremendous speed or force and can easily punch through metal, not to mention flesh and bone. Be aware of pinch points when working on or around such tremendously powerful tools. A common application for fluid power systems in industrial settings is to lift or suspend heavy objects. The lifted or suspended object itself represents stored energy as does the fluid under pressure supporting them. These need to be taken into consideration when performing maintenance on these types of systems, and those lifted or suspended objects need to be lowered or blocked out and the pressure relieved from the system before maintenance operation can begin. Additionally, components such as accumulators or reservoirs or springs can store energy in a fluid power system and must be released and locked out prior to performing maintenance. The compressor may be turned off, but lifted or suspended objects and components like receiver springs and accumulators may still pressurize the system. Finally, fluid under pressure and moving through a system can sometimes present thermal danger. Compressors in pneumatic systems can be unusually hot due to the compression process and equally as cold when discharged. Allow time for these components to return to ambient temperature between shutdown and maintenance. All right, this about wraps up this brief introduction to pneumatic systems. In conclusion, this lecture performed a brief introduction to pneumatic systems. We examined the similarities and important differences between hydraulic and pneumatic systems and compared and contrasted the behavior of systems using incompressible oil and compressible air. Lastly, we reviewed important safety guidance when working with fluid power systems. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. 
Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.